Hello everyone, welcome to a new video. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to conduct exploratory factor analysis using Jamovi. If you would like to learn how to do confirmatory factor analysis, I have a separate video for that and I can put the link down in the description. All right, so this will focus more on exploratory factor analysis. And we use exploratory factor analysis mostly if we have a newly constructed scale, test, or instrument. Um, and then you want to determine if the items in your test or scale can be reduced to factors, if you can group them together. You can um, answer the question, how many factors are there in your instrument? For some of us, we have experience um, creating a test. That's why you are watching this video. And you want to know if the items in your test can be grouped together in a meaningful way. For example, you created a test that measures two types of personality characteristics or personality traits. Of course, you expect that some items will be measuring personality trait A, while other items will be measuring personality trait B. Right, and um, so in order for us to confirm our um, in order for us to determine if our test really has two dimensions as we hypothesize, we can use exploratory factor analysis. Okay, for today's demonstration, I'm going to use the data set from my study, and if you're familiar with this questionnaire, this is the implicit. For those who, who haven't encountered this concept before, this questionnaire measures implicit theories of intelligence. According to this theory, there are two types of mindsets or implicit theories of intelligence. And these are the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. So the fixed mindset is the belief that regardless what you do, you cannot improve or increase your intelligence you cannot change your intellectual ability. Well, the growth mindset refers to the mindset or belief that intelligence, intellectual capacity can be increased, can be improved with effort, can be changed, can be developed. Okay? And this is the test created by, this is the scale created by Carl Dweck to measure to what extent do we endorse fixed and growth mindset? So we have here on the left side of the screen, the fixed mindset items. And um, the test, by the way, is composed of eight items, four items for each domain, four items for each dimension. For the fixed mindset, here are the questions we have here. You have a certain amount of intelligence and you can't really do much to change it. We also have your intelligence is something about you that you can't change very much and so on. On the other hand, for growth mindset, it is measured by questions or statements. I mean, not questions, by state, statements such as, no matter who you are, you can change. You can significantly change your intelligence level. And you can always substantially change how intelligent you are. So as you can see, um, these are two different factors. And uh, we believe that items 1, 2, 4, 6 should measure fixed mindset, while 3, 5, 7, 8 should measure growth mindset. Okay, now, actually, um, EFA is used now, most of the time when we are dealing with newly constructed tests to determine how many factors are there. Okay, but for the sake of example, allow me to use an existing test. Well, if you have watched my video on confirmatory factor analysis, you will know that I also use this in my demonstration. Okay, but for the sake of example, allow me to use an existing test no? and the data I've collected using this scale to, to demonstrate no? um, exploratory factor analysis. Okay, but just to clarify, um, when we are testing the factor structure of existing tests that has been validated before, it's okay if we just use confirmatory instead of exploratory factor analysis. Well, anyway, now, um, let us proceed to the software. For this demonstration, I will be using Jamovi. Okay. And then to do factor analysis on the on top here, you can see factor. Just click on it. 
and look for exploratory factor analysis. And then what you have to do is that you have to drag the, you have first to look for the items. Okay, so we have here the theories of intelligence items from one to eight. You simply have to drag them from left to right, or you can just click the arrow, highlight all of them, then drag them to the right side or to the box on the right side. And then before we check the results, we can check on the following. Let's make sure that we check on Bartlett's test of spricity. Let's check on KMO. Okay. For the rotation, we can just use Oblimin. Um, there are different types of rotations here. Okay, but for this demonstration, we will be using um, Oblimin. If I'm correct, we use Varimax if we are dealing with um, an instrument and we believe that the factors are not supposed to be correlated with one another. But if we believe that the factors may be correlated with one another, we can use Oblimin. Okay, now according to the literature and according to the theory, there's a negative correlation between um, growth and fixed mindset. So let me use um, Oblimin rotation. Okay, um, for the factor loadings, you can use 0.3 but some would use minimum of 0.4. So what this does is to hide loadings lower than 0 0.04. So you can, it, so if the, if the factor loading is blank, it means that it's lower than 0 0.04, okay? And then I'd like to sort loadings by size for easier interpretation, okay? And then, so now for the number of factors, okay, we have several options here. Like the number of factors extracted can be based on parallel analysis or based on the eigenvalue or based on a fixed number. Okay. Before we change the settings here, actually we can just stick with parallel analysis. Why? Um, because as we can see, the number of factors that emerge on the right side of the screen no, in the results it says that there are two factors, okay? So basically it confirms our prediction that there will be two factors. In some cases, uh, my students will predict that there will be two factors, but in reality, it turned out that there were three or even four factors or even more than that, okay? So in those cases, instead of relying on the parallel analysis, we use fixed number and we enter the number of the predicted factor um, but I only encourage you to do that if there's a, if you can find a theory that can support your your um, that can support your decision to base it or to fix it to a certain number. For example, um, in this case, we can say that we can fix it to two factors since there are only two types of theories of intelligence according to Dweck's theory. So you can also do that, no in case um, it turned out that it will have more than um, two factors, okay? Um, but now, since two factors emerge, we can just stick with parallel analysis. We can also use eigenvalue, okay? But first, let me explain to you, okay, some statistics here before we interpret the results, all right? So as you can see, we have here the results for the Bartlett's test of spricity and the KMO, and the the results of the Bartlett's test of spricity it should be significant. This is a one of the requirements for doing exploratory factor analysis. Basically, what this tells us, if the p value is significant, it tells us that um, there are correlations between the items. There are relationships between the items. So it's possible for us to group them together into factors. It's possible to reduce our eight item scale to two to, to a certain number of factors. In this case, to two. Okay, since the p-value is significant, it means there's a reason to believe that the items are correlated. There's some degree of association between the items, hence they can be grouped together. If this is not significant, then it means that there's no relationship between the items, making it hard for us to group them together. Okay. And now for the KMO, it tells us if our sample is adequate enough for um, exploratory factor analysis, usually the minimum here is 0 
some say some would say 0.5 so since our value here is 0.8 it means that we have more than enough sample for our analysis. Now, aside from what I've mentioned earlier, what are the other bases for the number of factors? We can also, here on the left side, we can also check on initial eigenvalues and screen plot. Okay. What can be our basis for the factors? No? As I said earlier, we can, um, we can have several bases. Now, let's talk about eigenvalues. In terms of eigenvalues, according to uh, our references, for you to know how many factors should be retained, check how many factors in the table had eigenvalues greater than 1. As you can see, the eigenvalue of factor 1 is 2.7, while the eigenvalue of factor 2 is 1.11. It means, while the rest have very low eigenvalues, it means that we can reduce the items to two factors, two dimensions. However, even though this is a good basis, in some cases, we have a reason to believe that a certain factor should be retained, but its eigenvalue is lower than one. Say, for example, 0.9. So there are instances that something like that happens. Okay, which is why uh, it's... Uh, there are other things that we should consider, not simply base it on the eigenvalues. Something related to eigenvalues is the scree plot. Basically, the scree plot is just the eigenvalues plotted okay, on, um, on a chart. And how do you interpret what is um, in the scree plot? Okay. So what we do here is that we look for the point of inflection or the elbow. When we say the elbow, it is the part of the line graph where there is a sudden change in the angle. Okay. So as you can see, this is the first dot, the second dot, and the third one. Okay, and basically the angle, you no, know, the L, the, the angle you know, of the line suddenly changed after the third one. So if we base it on that criteria, the third one is the elbow or the point of inflection. We can say that we should retain three factors because that's the number of dots before uh, that's the number of dots no before um the line was uh, flattened however like what i said no it, uh, just like with eigenvalues it it can also have its um we should not solely base our decision on what the eigenvalues and the script that is saying okay it, this may be the elbow but theoretically we know that we should only reduce it we should redu reduce it to two factors not three Right, um, two is has more theoretical sense than three. So, so we have several bases in factor analysis in the number of factors. It can be the eigenvalue, it can be the elbow of the scree plot, but most importantly, we can also base it on a theory. If you have a reason to believe that there should be three dimensions, theoretically speaking, then um, you can say that you will retain three dimensions in the final version of the test. Much better if it is also supported by the screen plot in the eigenvalues. Okay, but uh, look at this. No? In this case, the, the elbow no, is on the third dot no? even though um, we believe, oh, even though there's a reason for us to believe that we should only retain two. Well, um, just uh, I should mention this. Well, for some other scholars, they would say that it's not the elbow that's really the basis but the number of eigenvalues higher than one. So this is one, as you can see, this is one. And uh, first and second dots are higher than one. Just like what I said, this is just the eigenvalues plotted. So if that will be the basis, there are still two dimensions no, remaining, or th the final number of dimensions can still be reduced to two. Oh, so there are cases in which the number of the, the, the elbow is hard to determine. I've tried handling data like that in the past where it's hard to determine where is the actual elbow because there are so many um, changes in the angle in the in the screen plot. Well, anyway, um, now it's time for us to interpret the results. Okay, so as we can see, let me copy this to Excel. Let me copy this to Excel so that you can see it clearly. 
it's good if we can look at the items and the results side by side so that you'll know how we can, you know which items are measured by those that we load under certain uh, factors. Okay, there you go. All right, so now we have here the results. Okay, so how do you interpret the results of the factor analysis? So this is what we call factor loading, right? And all items with loadings under factor one form a dimension. They form, they can be grouped together. While those items that mesh that has factor loadings that have factor loadings under number two or factor two, they group uh, they form a separate group of items. So now let's take a closer look. All right, this is the part. If you read the textbooks, this is the part in which we name the dimensions. So number one, the items that loaded under number one are the following. Number two number one, number four, number six. If you double check that with um, our slides on the right, the items that loaded on factor one are the fixed mindset items. So we can label factor one as fixed mindset. While obviously, so since there are already four items here and there are only four items remaining, these are the growth mindset items, item number eight, item number seven, item number five, um, and three. So these are the growth mindset items. Okay. In this case, we are not going to delete any item because their factor loadings are all at least 0.4. And um, none of the items loaded onto the incorrect subscale. So what do you, what do I mean by that? What is what is what do I mean by loading into the wrong subscale? For example, if the loading of number eight is here, it's loading on one even though it's supposed to load on number two. So if that's the case, you can eliminate the item or try to think if that should be transferred to that subscale. Okay. But um, in this case, it wouldn't make sense if it will load under factor one. Instead, it should be eliminated. Okay. And also. It's not good if a certain item will load onto another factor at the same time. For example, what if there's a number here, 0.4? Well, there's 0.8 on factor 2. It means it, this is a case of cross-loading. The item measures or it can be under factor 1 and factor 2 at the same time. So if there's a high cross-loading, say for example, um, a very high cross-loading, some would consider 4 as... For example, if there's a cross-loading of 0.4, they already eliminate it. But if the cross-loading is very low, no? like in this case, um, the reason why this is empty is because it doesn't load enough on factor 1, which is why there are only numbers under factor 2 because items 8, 7, 5, and 3 only load onto factor 2 while items 2, 4, 2, 1, 4, and 6 only load under factor 1, not, in, not on factor 2. All right, so that is it for my tutorial on exploratory factor analysis. I hope this demonstration is very helpful. If you want to watch, I encourage you to want to watch my video on confirmatory factor analysis as well. Okay, after this step, we can now proceed to reliability analysis. I also have a separate video for that. But for today, that's all for exploratory factor analysis. Thank you very much. See you next time.